everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Candid Kaya. Are you interested in becoming a doctor? A doctor of philosophy, that is. If so, stay tuned to learn how you can get those three prestigious letters after your name. P-H-D. So today, I have Chelsea, who is a doctoral candidate and also a very close friend. So Chelsea, let the viewers know just a little bit about yourself. Okay. So, hello, my name is Chelsea Johnson. I am a graduate of Spelman College. I'm 25 years old and currently I'm in my fourth year of a PhD in sociology program at the University of Southern California. Right now I'm living in Brooklyn, New York, where I'm writing my dissertation on race, gender, and the body. Tell us all just a little bit about what inspires you to pursue a PhD right out of college. Well, so while I was at Spelman, I was part of several different research opportunity programs. The first was the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship. I also did a summer research program at Ohio State. So I had a lot of really good research opportunities while I was an undergrad mm -hmm. in the nurturing environment that I had at Spelman. So I felt like I was prepared uh, to apply right after graduating. And I also knew in deciding between a PhD program and a master's that PhD programs are typically fully funded. Um, while master's programs, you're paying tuition. So for a money reason, I also thought if I can get into a PhD program right away, and I know that I want to have a career in research, then I should try and do so right away. So how did you choose something out of all those wonderful majors that you wanted to study for five years? Because I know uh, I like math. I have a math degree, but I don't PhD like math. <laughs> so I wanted to know what I guess inspired you or what did you learn at Spelman or in your other degrees that made you want to further study that subject mm -hmm. for another five years? Okay, so I've always been interested in hearing people's stories. So when I started Spelman, I originally thought about doing journalism. However, Spelman doesn't have a journalism or communications program. Instead, they have English and I really wasn't interested in doing like literary critiques on fiction or nonfiction. I wanted to write and I wanted to research. So I chose to do sociology because you're studying the way people live, you're studying social life, and then you're spending actually a longer amount of time dedicated to that topic as opposed to turning things out mm -hmm. on a quick deadline like you are for journalism. So I found that I really love telling stories. I really love telling stories about people like me, women of color, um, how we live our lives, which is really marginalized in academic research. And so I found that uh, a research career in sociology really spoke to both my experiences and voices of people who are not included in dominant narratives. Okay, scholar! <laughs> so you just mentioned funding and how most PhD programs are fully funded, but is that something that is applicable for all PhD programs? So most PhD programs are. Now okay. some programs where you might be going for the name of it can get away with accepting maybe two or three students on a not funded basis, but typically you wouldn't want to go to a program that isn't funded as a PhD because the process is so long. Okay. In the shortest amount of time, it would take five years. On the long end, it could take 10 plus. And college tuition is expensive. It would be forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year, right. plus you have living expenses. And for a time commitment that's, long, that's that long, it's just not feasible. And you really shouldn't be working while you're writing your dissertation. It's a full-time project. So don't go anywhere if they're not offering you money. They should offer you money. So when you say offering money, are you talking about scholarship money? Or is there also sometimes stipends included? Yes. So tuition is fully funded. And also you get a stipend um, that really depends on what the living the cost of living is in whatever the university is that you are. So it can be in the middle of nowhere, you might be getting something as low as 18000 In a major city, it could be like 30, 35000 So you are living pretty low as far as funding costs, but you're not in any debt for that entire amount of time, which is another reason why it's easy to do this when you're coming right out of undergrad and mm -hmm. you don't have many expenses or familial responsibilities. If you're doing this later at 32 or 40, um, sometimes you have a lot more as far as like your parents need help, you might have children. So that's another reason if you know that this is a career path for you and you know that you're going to need a PhD, it can help just in terms of what your life is doing and what your responsibilities are to do that earlier. 
So Chelsea, let us know, because you're a fourth year doctoral candidate, let us know how has that process been? Okay, so your first two to three years you are taking coursework and you're sitting in classes. Um, during that time you earn your master's through completing a master's thesis or in what my department we call an empirical paper, which is based on your own research. Okay. And oftentimes you can use term papers to help you think about what it is you'll be writing for your master's thesis. And then during your what was my third year, sometimes it's people's fourth year or whenever they are ready, um, you take qualifying exams. And basically what a qualifying exam is, is you demonstrating your expertise on your areas. So my areas are race and gender. I took an exam in race and I took an exam in gender. Um, and different programs are different in how those are structured. But for mine, you have um, a reading list of everything that's important to know that's ever been written in sociology on those topics. They give you um, three questions and you turn in 30 pages on those questions on a Monday. They give you the questions on a Friday and six weeks later you do the next one. So that's definitely the most intense, challenging part of the program. And basically then you're demonstrating to your committee, your dissertation committee, that you know as much as they do or as much as is possible for you to know before you start your dissertation. Okay. And then upon that time, you do your dissertation proposal, you defend that with your committee, and now at the stage I'm at, I'm just writing my dissertation and doing dissertation research. Very impressive. So you just stated um, some of the challenges in the process, really. So what have been some of the most rewarding experiences you had? Okay, so my most rewarding experiences, I would have to say, would be meeting the people that I'm doing the research about. So as a qualitative researcher, I participate in ethnography, which is participant observation, mm -hmm. meaning I'm at a field site and I'm, I'm observing the way people are interacting in that field site, how they're talking about the issues that matter to them, um, and interviewing women. So being able to have that personal one-on-one -on -one experience and then think deeply about what those experiences mean in aggregate mm -hmm. um, is really rewarding to me, especially because I'm interviewing people who have similar experiences to me and who look like me and who often have been marginalized or celebrated in the same similar ways. Some other really rewarding experiences I've had are being awarded grants to do my research and especially doing that research overseas. So I participated um, in the Black European Studies program, which was housed um, in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, was able to meet scholars on Black European studies and Black diaspora studies from all over the world. Um, and I'll be traveling to South Africa this fall, also doing dissertation research. So it's been really rewarding choosing a topic that has an international and global focus. So it allows me to go places that I've wanted to go, um, learn in a more multidimensional way, which I hope later on will allow me to compete better on the job market. So you just talked about the job market. So mm -hmm. what are your plans once you've become Dr. Chelsea? So my plan is to um, be a professor at a liberal arts college. I would love to be back at a historically black college or a women's college because I think those are communities that need to be served and that um, need to read literature that reflects their experiences. And that was one of the most rewarding things about attending Spelman is because it was the first time where really in all my classes, whether they were in the humanities or the social sciences or even the sciences, where um, scholars' work was celebrated, who were women, who were women of color, who were from third world countries. Um, and that's something that I didn't get in high school. And that's something that also now in my PhD program, I realized that other people didn't get as an undergrad or in master's program. So that allowed me in classrooms and the PhD level to be able to say, well, actually, like this totally excludes all these people's experiences. So it really allows you to compete better, um, even in more diverse work environments when you have a well-rounded knowledge about all the people that live on the earth. What three things should one consider when choosing a PhD program? Okay, so when you are applying to PhD programs, you're applying to specific people and not necessarily to the department. So you want to make sure that there are people there who believe in your research and who are able to mentor you. So that's the most important thing. Secondly, I would say rankings really matter. So the ranking of your department is 
extremely important and studies have shown that's really the biggest determining factor on where you are placed upon graduation. So before you even start your dissertation, before you even start school, rankings unfortunately or like sometimes fortunately is a big determining factor of where you'll end up. And lastly, I would say that the program is in a place where you can see yourself living for the next five, seven, nine years. It's your life, and you're going to be living it that whole time as well. Okay. So, what are three steps to staying in a PhD program? Okay, three steps I would say maintaining really strong relationships with the people in your program. That's your committee, that's also your cohort, the people who are there with you. Um, also, maintaining outside relationships with a support system, having a support network of family and friends who can be there when you're at a low point. Um, PhD work is really isolating because everybody is doing a different topic. When you're reading, you're reading by yourself. Um, when you're writing, you're writing by yourself. Mm -hmm. If you're a social person, that can be really hard. So making sure, also, thirdly, that you have outlets of activities that you really enjoy. So whether if you like yoga, if you like painting, if you like traveling, you can't forget to continue doing those things. It always seems like research work is never done. There's always more you can read. There's always more you can write. There's always more people you can talk to. So being able to take a break for self-care is of the utmost importance. So Chelsea, tell us what your experience has been like as a woman of color who is pursuing a PhD. Oh, Nakaya. As we know, over the past year, it's been a really tumultuous time for um, black students in particular in higher education. And that's certainly also the case in um, master's programs and PhD programs. And when I started, I was the only black student in any social science PhD program at my university, which says a lot because they, these degrees take so long to complete. Um, and that's not because there were, weren't many other women, black women, black men who were qualified and who were determined enough to gain admittance. That's because oftentimes those factors are not considered in, in admissions um, and those are systemic injustices. Um, so sometimes those things are really difficult to get past and like nobody's ever the exception. You just have to stay really um, steadfast in the goal and remember that you're standing on many people's shoulders to be where you are, and you're also opening the door for many other people behind you. So while I've been at USC, I've also made it um, a mission of mine to involve myself with undergrads, to be part of the Black Graduate Student Network, to speak up in faculty meetings that, you know, sociologists, we know that this is a problem. We study race, we study class, um, we study these things as systemic issues in social life, and so reminding people that this should be a priority um, amongst all other priorities, amongst research priorities, service priorities, teaching priorities. So taking the opportunity to be a scholar and an activist um, helps me bring purpose to what I'm doing and gets through those hard times of being the only one. So Chelsea, thank you so much for joining today's episode. There is one last thing I want to know, though, and that is when I am Dr. Chelsea, I plan to... I plan to be a professor whose career is equally balanced between research, teaching, service, and activism. And I hope that my, my research speaks into um, strategies for anti-racist or feminist social justice, that I can enact that in the classroom, um, and that I can be a woman in higher academia who is contributing to the scholarly conversations in my field. And there you have it, everybody. Dr. Chelsea coming to you 2017. Chelsea, thank you so much for coming on today's episode and sharing your story and your experience thus far in a PhD program. I'm sure that you have inspired so many, and I hope that you guys share this video with anyone who you know that's interested in pursuing a PhD. So if you have any questions for Chelsea, just leave them below and we'll make sure that they get answered. Again, we thank you for tuning in to Candid Kaya and stay tuned for the next episode.